Moving on here because we want to keep on schedule with what's happening. And uh, I just have appreciated so much that I've heard from everyone that spoke uh, all the way from the devotions, prayer requests, uh, the lessons, the teaching, and getting to meet so many wonderful people. Uh, I wish I could have met your superintendent, Brother Bodegas, because uh, I have heard nothing but wonderful remarks about him and his work and his ministry. And uh, when you're the superintendent of a whole country, that is a tremendous responsibility. And so you do need to pray for your leaders just as you uh, seek to have your people in your church and even in your section or whatever praying for you. And everybody said amen? Amen. We're right here before lunch, so I don't want you to fall asleep and I don't want you to fall out and die of starvation either. Uh, we're going to make it. Now, my subject is simply this. If you look in your notes there, it's uh, the lesson entitled under Leadership Development International here in the Manila uh, area of the Philippines. Um. If we ever needed leaders, it is now. Everybody say, it is now. It is now. The world desperately needs spiritual leaders. Spiritual leaders that have an understanding of the times, what's going on in our world. Now, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Exodus chapter 3. And this is a chapter that deals with the call of God upon the life of Moses. And uh, it's an interesting story, as we well know, and absolutely amazing. Now in chapter 3 and verse 10, the scripture says, Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, how did this happen? One of the most um, miraculous and amazing calls of God for a person to do the work of God is the story of Moses, the burning bush. You're very familiar with that story. Imagine a bush that is not consumed and a voice speaking to it, uh, out of it, and speaking to Moses and telling him to take off his shoes for the ground you're standing on is holy ground. Out there in the middle of nowhere. Forty years been walking around in the desert. He once sat at the table of Pharaoh. He learned in the greatest universities of, of intelligentsia of that day. And then to be stuck in the desert for 40 years. Well, you see, the call can come sometimes from within yourself. And the call can come dramatically or in a, a way that lets you know that this is divine. This is God that is speaking. Do you remember one day when Moses was kind of in the palace? Now remember, he had been taught by his mother. When they found him in the river and Miriam, his sister, went to Pharaoh's daughter and said, Oh, there's a, I can find a nurse for that child if you'd like. And so Pharaoh's daughter said, yes. And Miriam took her little baby brother who was escaping the wrath of Pharaoh and took that child to the child's mother. And Jochebed was able to teach and impart into that little Moses, the future deliverer, the future son of Pharaoh, but the future deliverer of God's people was able to teach him about the mighty God. And one day, years later, after he'd been taken to Pharaoh's house and to the daughter's house and raised as a son, he sees an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew. And something welled up within him because he, he remembered all that his real mother had taught him and told him about. And something rose up within him and he felt a call, he felt a closeness to his people. And that somehow could he do anything for them and he slew that Egyptian that was hurting that Hebrew. Hit him in the sand. Thought it was all over. 
Next day he saw two Hebrews striving together. And he went to kind of separate them. And, and they more or less looked at him and said, Who made you the king over us? You're going to slay us like you did that Egyptian. And at that point, he knew, I better get out of here. He wanted to be on the side of God's people. And there was a call. There was something inside of him, innate, that said, I've got to be with my people. And I've got to stand up for them. But he knew if Pharaoh found out he was a dead man and into the wilderness he went. And 40 years later, after walking around that wilderness and looking at the north end of a sheep going south for 40 years, out there under the hot sun, it was then that God dramatically spoke to him in the burning bush. Now, what a call. I mean, not everybody gets a call of the burning bush or a great light from heaven or hot coals of fire being put upon their lips like an Isaiah or the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. But yet the call is very distinct and clear and powerful in, in God's economy. You are called here today. You are called to be a child of God, but you are called to be a minister of the gospel, a spouse, uh, uh, whatever the case might be. And you are doing a spiritual work in a secular world. And that's a dramatic confrontation that takes place. You've got to have the call of God in your life. It's not just something I choose to do. Like I choose to become a, a mathematician or an engineer or a lawyer or a plumber or whatever it might be. No, no. When you have the burning bush experience and when you have your personal call, it just leaves an impression upon you that you cannot deny. And so from that time, God began to speak to Moses and uh, began to tell him what he had planned to do for his life. And of course, Moses said, not me. I'm not up to that kind of a job. I've been 40 years out of anywhere near any kind of civilization. I can't do that, can't speak. You know, you know all of the excuses that he had. And he was frustrated within himself. And said, they won't listen to me. And God said to him, what's that in your hand? He said, it's a rod. Throw it down. He threw it down. It became a serpent. And then God said, pick it up. Now that takes a little bit of faith. I don't know how you handle snakes here, but I like to handle snakes in Tennessee with a shovel or uh, with an axe. Yeah. <laughs> I don't handle them any other way. But he, by faith, picked that up. Because, I mean, he just had a burning bush experience. Something's going on here. God's, and it became a lot. And then God gave him another sign, as you well know, putting of his hand into the Bush into up. his garment and pulling it out. It was all white and uh, leprous. And then he said, "Put it in again, take it up, and it was clean." And then pouring blood, water that became blood, and said, "With these signs, you'll go before Pharaoh." Yeah. Now, that was an amazing thing. <laughs> and I want to pause here because. He thought, and even after he said, I can't speak, I can't do it. God said, you've got a brother, uh, Aaron, and you're going to get reunited with him after 40 years, and he can speak for you. And when that time comes, you're going to go in before Pharaoh, and you're going to do what you just did. And Moses thought, okay, we'll see what happens here. I've never been able to do that. Can you imagine? You kind of would have a new respect for a rod, wouldn't you? Because if you drop it, what could happen? Come a serpent. And so, in that power and in that authority, with all of his misgivings, he had that burning bush call and that signs from God, and he was ready to go in before Pharaoh. 
Finally, the day came, and God said, you know, Pharaoh's going to call on you and say, show us a miracle for you. And at that time, I want you to have Aaron hand it and put that rod down. And you know what will happen. And Moses thought, well, that's pretty impressive. I go before Pharaoh, and I do that. And he is going to realize that he's up against something bigger than a Moses but Almighty God. Amen. And so the day came, and they marched in there after having been rebuffed before, and sure enough, as they petitioned Pharaoh, he said, show us a miracle! What have you got? And Moses thought to himself, ooh, wait till he sees this. <laughs> oh, Aaron, come over here. And right in front of Pharaoh, and they thought, oh, this is going to be good. Pharaoh's going to be running for cover. They said, throw it down. <laughs> Became a serpent. And Moses is thinking, oh, Pharaoh's going to back up on this one. He's going to let us go. And Pharaoh calls in his magicians, his seers, you know, the witchcraft and all of that. And guess what? They throw down their rods and they became serpents. Now it's not in the Bible. So I can't say declaratively, but probably I'm thinking Moses in his mind is saying, God, you never told me about this. You never told me they would have that kind of an ability. And I can imagine there was kind of a bit of a trepidation. And all of a sudden, one snake which was from the rod of Moses, and then there's probably 15, 20, or 30 of them from all of the seers and those that practice the mystical art from Egypt. And that one rod was totally outnumbered. And Moses, there was probably a fear. And suddenly, you know the story. That one serpent that came from Moses' rod swallowed up every one of them and God was telling Moses not Pharaoh so much but Moses that I'm on your side and if God is for you who can be against you and you've got a call and that call is going to keep you in the tough times amen, amen. you know I believe strongly in the call of God you know, sometimes some people say, and it may be true, why are you preaching the gospel? Well, I saw the need. And that's good. That's very good. If you see the need and you endeavor to do what you can. But let me tell you, when you've got a true, genuine call of God upon your life, you are going to be able to endure things that you never anticipated because you can look back and remember there was a burning bush. Uh, there was an experience. There was a voice. Uh, there was an impression. There was something that came upon you. You know, I thank God for, for my life, its experiences, the things that have happened to me. Now, I, I'm blessed. I'm fourth generation Pentecost. And I'm 73 years old. So my parents were in this, born into it, Apostolic Pentecost. My grandmother was the first one to come in as an immigrant from the country of Scotland and came into a red hot revival in the city of Winnipeg in 1918. And it was a powerful revival there that not only affected her, but uh, also my father's parents who were immigrants from, from Ukraine. Odessa, Ukraine, and they had come to Canada, but a revival took place in that church at uh, Apostolic Temple was the name of it, and you say, how big of a revival was it? It was a revival that lasted for 10 years. They had service every night of the week for 10 years. When 
God began to move like special revival services. Then they would have a 10.30 in the morning service. And they would have service every night of the week. Three times on Sunday. Over 10,000 plus baptized in Jesus name. Thousands of miracles that happened in that time. And that's what brought our family into apostolic Pentecost. And so I thank God for that. But you know what? You can't live on somebody else's experience. Right. You can't live on grandma's. You can't live on uncle so-and-so. You can't live on your wife's or your, your husband's or whatever the case might be. God's got to do something. You can come into Pentecost, but you know what? Pentecost has got to come into you. You've got to get it for yourself. All right. And I'll never forget one of the great experiences of my life was uh, going to camp. And then uh, somebody talked about building a campground in one of the districts here. 1959, I went to my first camp as a kid. I'm only 10 years old. But I was with the people of God there, and some beautiful things happened. And I was baptized in an old muddy pond and just outside of St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, I came up out of that water. And, uh, and I began, began my young, real walk with God. Because something had happened in that meeting. And I'll never forget, I got home. And the Lord talking to my young heart. And I thought in the spirit. These are the people I want to spend the rest of my life with. And that was 63 years ago. A few months later, God filled me with the Holy Ghost. And to this day. That church, I went by it the other day, had been by there for years, and it's owned by someone else now. When I looked at that building and I thought, I'll never forget, May the 5th, 1960, when God filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost in that place. It's a landmark to me. Amen. It's a place of great significance. And so, I remember those, those times that are so important to us. And then... Uh, I remember the month of May of 1967. I was already working, working in computers, and they were getting ready to send me into school and additional training. That was way back when computers were as big as this room. I'm not kidding. IBM 360, the 1401, you don't even know what that is. Yeah. But I, I went to my cousin's wedding, and I would say this, I was not totally backslid, no, and you know what, in all those years, and I'm not bragging, but I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never drank a, took a drink of alcohol in my life except one time in a communion service in the Neprzezens in Ukraine, and they were, having, they were having communion service. And I didn't know it. They gave me the community bowl when I was visiting, and I drank first, and it was wine. That's it. That's all I've ever had. That's it. And so I thank God I wasn't infected with drugs like, you know, so many people are in our world today. That's maybe where you came from. But, but I was cool in the Lord. I was getting ready to be cold. And I was Laodicea. And I went to a youth convention there. And already God had been tugging on my heart and using some other people to speak to me. And in that, I'll never forget. And in fact, it was an amazing thing. Went to that youth convention and Brother J.T. Pugh spoke. A great man of God has gone on to be with the Lord. And it was at that old high school there in Belleville. And Brother Stickler Pastor Sarah. He wasn't even born. He wasn't even a dream in his mom and dad's eyes. In those days, that was in 1967. But Brother Pew said, there's somebody out here. God is dealing with you. And you think you've got your life planned out and what direction you're going to go. But God is speaking to you right now. And you've got to come to a decision point and make up your mind what you're going to do. Are you really going to serve God? It may be that you already bought a car and you've already made your plans for your life and you're a young person. But you know what? 
It may be that God wants you to sell that car and make plans and go to study in a Bible school for ministry. I must have been sitting there with a huge big target on me. Because God was speaking to me. And for an hour, hour and a half, after everybody had left that old high school auditorium on a bare concrete floor, I was on my face before the Lord. And I can tell you the place, if it's still there, and I can tell you the time that God gave me my burning bush. Mine is not yours. Yours is not mine. Everybody is different. But I'm talking to you about the call of God. And from that I got up. Didn't have to sell the car. In the end I got to take it to Bible school. But I went to Bible school. And here we are 55 years later. And I had no idea what God would do with my life. I didn't think I'd ever preach a sermon. Or uh, teach a Bible study. I didn't know that I could do anything like that. But I'm here to tell you. Once God puts something in your heart. You trust him with all your might and you have faith in God and see what the Lord will do. And so I want us to go to our notes here. Because it's important. We never know what we will encounter on the journey as we fulfill God's call. Can you imagine Moses as he gets out there in the wilderness and the griping and the complaining and the challenges of the lack of water and no food and, and uh, people just shooting at him from every direction. Wonder how could I ever get into such a monumental task? But he can always look back to that divine call in his heart. And no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the challenges, no matter what's going on, you know that you've got something in your heart that came from heaven and it can go against every obstacle, opposition, and every trial that you will face in the ministry, in the work of God. Can you say amen? amen. Now look at uh, Mark chapter 4 and verse 35. Just for a moment here, I'm hurrying on, but uh, I just wanted to lay a little bit of a, uh, you know, ground base here for us, but very famous story, Mark 4.35, and the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. Everybody say the other side. The other side. Let us, not me, Jesus didn't say me, he said let us pass over unto the other side. Now, they knew, okay, we're going to get in the boat. We've been in the boat many times. We're fishermen. We're familiar with it. We're going to sail on, and we're going to go to the other side. And true to his word, they did get over to the other side. But unfortunately, there was a storm in the middle, and they were afraid. And these seasoned fishermen felt that they were going to lose possibly their life because of obedience to the master. Now, think about this. There's a gap, if you'll follow in your notes there, between God's promise and its fulfillment. It's that gap in between saying go to the other side and actually getting to the other side. That's where all the fun is. That's where all the challenge is. That's where all the fretting is. That's where all the fear comes in. That in-between point. So, how we react. Everybody say react. Yeah. Write that in there. How you react to the challenge and how we act going forward determines the measure of our faith in God. Because you're into a spiritual realm when God calls you. And it's going to take you in places you never thought you'd enter into. And you had no idea that they were on the horizon. Now, my question here is, God is omnipotent. In other words, if he knows all things, he's all-powerful, omniscient, uh, omnipresent. 
He knows all these things. Why did he send his disciples into the storm? Couldn't he have said, fellas, there's going to be a storm out there. We're going to have to wait for about three hours. See, I know there's a storm out there, and we're going to have to wait here a little bit, but, but then it'll calm down, and we can go. But he sent them into the storm. I tell you what, when you're following Jesus, you're always in school. He's going to teach you some things. So, he sent his disciples into the storm. And my question would be, why didn't he at least warn them? Say, now boys, we're going to hit a little bit of rough water here. You know, when you go on the airplane, the pilot starts getting inside. He said, you know what, we got a little bit of turbulence here, but just fasten your seatbelt and we'll be all right. <coughs> at least you know it's coming, when all of a sudden, boom, the plane drops like that. You talk about fear. So the warning is good. But Jesus didn't warn them. He was asleep in the ship. And they were battling wind and waves. And maybe the boat would capsize. And somewhere there's a lesson to be learned. Many lessons. And here, as you write in there, never doubt a promise of God and never doubt the word of God. Never doubt the word of God. You know what the disciples experienced? They had spiritual amnesia. You know what amnesia is? That's when you forget things. My wife says I have that all the time. I forgot to do what she told me to do. But... but Sometimes we think we hear the word, but we don't hear the word. Let us go to the other side. And that should have been, yes, sir. Well, there could be a storm up there. Doesn't matter. He said, we're going to the other side. We're going to be all right. Yeah, but there's going to be lightning. There's going to be thunder. There's going to be waves. There's going to be uh, the, the, the rain. Doesn't matter. We're going to the other side. But we look at the rain, and we look at the clouds, and we look at the wind, and we look at the surf, and we say, we're in big trouble. And we get filled with fear. See, I'm talking to you today, somebody in your ministry, right now. You're in the midst of a storm, and the devil said, just quit. There's somebody out there that can do a better job than you, so just quit. But we forget that he said, he will never leave us, nor forsake us, even to the end of the age. You think God's going to reject you, forget about you? No, sometimes He wants to see your faith challenged. And every time God challenges your faith and you come through, He'll have another challenge. But all the while you're growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and it's leading you on to greater things. All right. Hallelujah. And so we're in a storm. And I'm, I'm, I'm preaching today. You know what preaching is? That's when you teach but you do it a little louder sometimes. <laughs> but I'll try to get back. What a storm we are in. 2022. And I know much has been said about all of the pandemics and all of the COVIDs and all the boxes. I didn't know we had a camel box. I don't know if there's an elephant box, but it could be a big one. But seriously, it's, it's a real fear. I've lost friends and you have too. Today, uh, Al Khamenei, or whatever his name is, they, they destroyed that number two man in Al Qaeda. It was in the news today. And that happened a long time ago. But he was assassinated today in Afghanistan by secret forces. The third most powerful person in the United States is going into Taiwan today, which, in case you don't know, is just north of us here. 
And China says, don't do that. You play with fire. And so Taiwan is on full alert. And we're facing unbelievable things. Of course, you're well familiar with the Ukraine and I mean, we're, uh, Mr. Gutierrez, the head of the United Nations says we're right there. One miscalculation and the world could be blown to pieces. Brother Buckland spoke so well about our moral dilemma in this world. The collapse of things that we value so much. And I'm not going to reiterate all of that. It's simply to say, in my lifetime, I have seen unbelievable things happen. Okay. And to see the morals of our world and, and America, and I hate to say it, it's the leader of the world in a lot of things, but it's many times the leader of immorality and ungodliness and filth that's coming out of Hollywood and infesting the nations of the world and, and changing the spiritual mores of society. There were people that didn't serve God way back 40, 50, 60 years ago, but they knew morality. There was no such thing as divorce. Uh, there was not uh, uh, very little evidence of adultery and fornication. They, they had some basic values. When I was a kid growing up in school in Canada, do you know what they did? Every morning, this was in the 50s, our teacher would get up and she would read a song from the Bible. We would say the Lord's Prayer together. And then we would sing, O oh Canada. And then at the end of the day, we'd sing, God save the Queen. Can you imagine in America trying to read Bible scripture and trying to, uh, you know, uh, say the Lord's Prayer, it would never happen. I don't know what's happening here, but I'm going to tell you what. That's what's happened over there, and now all of that is gone. It's a godless society in so many ways, but God's called you as an apostolic minister to be a leader. I said a leader. What are you doing? You need to lead in morality. You need to lead in purity. You need to lead in righteousness. You need to be a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Thus saith the word of the Lord. You know what? And I've written it down here. If you saw the road ahead, you'd quit. Really? If you knew what was ahead for your ministry, many of you would say, I'm done. But you know what? His grace is sufficient for us. And when the tough time comes, you can look back and say, yeah, I remember when. Yes. It looked like we weren't going to get it through it. But the Lord said he'd take us to the other side. Mm -hmm. And there will be a strength that will rise up in you. Faith, building upon faith. Hallelujah. Now, notice here, we must never forget that the church is on the offense. Everybody say offense. Offense. You, when you play a sport game, whether it's uh, soccer or whether it's basketball or whatever, you have an offense or a defense. The defense is trying to defend the goal. The offense is trying to get the ball or whatever it is over the line or in the net or whatever it might be. And so they're pressing and, and, and the defense is stopping. And sometimes we think we have to always be on the defense of the church. But I'm here to tell you right now, we can be on the offense and we can go forth in the name of the Lord and in the midst of ungodliness and impurity and all of the things that have happened, there could be a voice from the church and the power of the gospel and the anointing of the Holy Ghost that can reach into the, the uh, drug dens in society and the uh, cesspool of iniquity and pull souls from the burning flames. Because the scripture said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Hell's powerful. It's got its... They think they've got everything under control and they're going to stop the life of the church out. But it's not going to happen. Because God says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Now, 
These two stories, the one of Moses, present snakes and storms. Everybody say snakes and storms. I don't like either one, do you? Storm came through our town in 2008. Now, I had uh, resigned the church and accepted the full-time uh, position of district superintendent in Tennessee. We had over 440 ministers uh, to uh, be involved with and uh, all of the churches. And, and uh, we had built a new church in the city of Jackson, Tennessee. And in 2008, that beautiful building that we built and paid for and just a tornado came and destroyed that church. Destroyed other things in town, nursing home and other things. You don't have tornadoes here, but when winds come in at 165 miles an hour and a twirling thing like this, you don't have any warning. Not like a hurricane, there's one coming that's out there, it'll be here two weeks. Uh-uh, tornadoes are there in a few seconds. So we don't like snakes and we don't like storms. Now, God's church faces the challenges of a very different world and society today. When my grandparents came in in 1918, you know, every woman wore dresses pretty well to the ground. Women didn't cut their hair. I mean, I'm not talking about in the church, I'm talking about in society. Now, we have in America the great undress. Wear as little as you possibly can. Naked people. And so society's changed. And leaders, and everybody say, that's me. Leaders must prepare. Write that down. You must prepare and build unshakable saints and leaders. Now, I'm not going to read Luke, but uh, 648 and 49, but you can read it. But build for your own consecration. You've got to be on fire for God. You've got to have the real goods. You can't be lukewarm. You've got to be on fire. So you've got to build for your own consecration, for your family, your church, and your ministerial team. All of these things are vital. It's so very important. You see, God's on your side. And... God has given us a hope. And here's what Hebrews 6.19 says. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. What does an anchor do? It causes you not to drift. It goes down and sinks into the bottom of the lake or the river or whatever. And as the tide comes in or the current comes and would try to pull that boat down, the anchor keeps it. We have an anchor for our soul. And that anchor is the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if it's 1422, uh, 1735, 1889, or 2022. Jesus Christ the same what? Yesterday, and today, and forever. And he will give you whatever you need to meet the challenges if you've got a call of God in your heart. How many believe that call of God is real? Amen. Now this next one, a little typo, it should be Jeremiah 29, 11. But it says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. In a very shaky world. I mean, people are literally scared to death. COVID has got them scared. World affairs, atomic weaponry, bombs, pestilences. Well, you've got to be unshakable. And the people are looking to their leaders. That's you. Your church. Your district. Do you really have the goods? Do you understand the power of God? Now the snakes are vicious, poisonous, and destructive to souls of men today. And, and this was brought so clearly by the owner. Thank you, Brother Buckman. The Bible is on trial worldwide. You see, 
it's not east versus west. It's not a socialism or communism versus democracy or theocracy or whatever you might. I tell you what, it is the Bible that is on trial. And they are saying the word of God is not true. And the Bible says that there are no absolutes. Uh, can't say that. Or thus saith the Lord. How dare you say it. That, that scripture in Romans 1 and 28, which talks about immoral conduct, men with men doing that which is unseemly. You can't get up and make statements like that. Yes, you can. Because that's what the Bible says. But they are tearing down the word of God. And so persecution of Christians, and particularly Pentecostals in many cultures, are taking place today. The Bible, everybody say the Bible, right. is not regarded as the Word of God. You know, in the United States, when the President of the United States takes the oath of office, he usually puts his hand upon the Bible. That's probably not going to happen much in the future. It's not regarded as the Word of God. Satan challenged the Word in the Garden of Eden. Now, the pursuit of of one's own interest with no authority over them, such as a pastor or the Bible, uh, that's something that's gone. That's gone. Christian morality has become old-fashioned, extreme, dangerous. They call us radicals. They call us dangerous in America. That we would dare to stand up for the Word of God. It produces premarital sex, promiscuity, perversion, redefinition of family, homosexuality, transgenderism. They tell us one, some said at least 29 different genders. And we heard about it, male and female creating that. It was pretty clear right from the beginning. And now we're trying to figure all of that out, society. Same-sex marriage, genetic engineering, chemical addictions, Drug addictions, mind altering, artificial intelligence, all this kind of stuff. And our society has become biblically illiterate, certainly in America and Canada. People don't even know who David and Goliath is. And in this world, that's what you as a leader, you've got to have an anchor for your soul. You've got to know what you know. No longer are right and wrong absolutes accepted. You can't say anything as thus saith the Lord. There's no absolutes. And they say, well, these are just psychological hang-ups that need to be healed. That's all it is. We can, you know, counsel through this. So society has rejected a Bible-based standard. That's what they've done. And adopted a self-centered, sin-based framework. The dirtier, the filthier, the more ungodly it is, the better that our society seems to appreciate it. Now here's a statement, I wrote it down. Nothing is more certain than the certainty that there are no certainties. Everything's up for grabs. No absolutes. The only absolute allowed is the insistence that there are no absolutes Accept and tolerant. They're tolerant everything. Tolerant, you can believe what you want. I mean, they're bringing in, you know, drag queens. I don't know if you know what that is, but that's men dressed up as women, and they want them to come into our little schools with our little kids and read uh, stories to them and to introduce them to the world of transgenderism and all of the perversions. And if it isn't happening here, it'll be here soon. And so, we've got a challenge. Now, unfortunately, the church world and many preachers, even so-called charismatic and tongue-talking people, have fallen into the trap of, Blessing! Come to me and you'll be blessed! Prosperity! God will give you a new car, a new house, and you'll never have to worry about money again. It's hard for me to stomach when Jesus didn't own anything but his own robe. God 
don't let me suffer mentality. In other words, blessed and healed and satisfied. It's a mentality where true discipleship is de-emphasized. Remember this, salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you something. Amen. God doesn't give you the Holy Ghost and say, now before I give it to you, will you promise to be a missionary and go to the deep dark jungles of Africa and spend 60 years there? Will you do that? Then I'll give you the Holy Ghost. No, he gives it. It's a gift. That's free. Discipleship. That's what you as leaders are doing. You're discipling. Cautiously. Do you remember when Jesus took the bread? He blessed it. He broke it. And he gave it. Remember that? And something happened. Now we've got blessed lives. We've been filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name, loving God. But until you come to a brokenness, a submission, a yielding to God as your ministry, I'm giving my life to you. Only then when you are broken and totally surrender can you be given. And your life can be reaching and touching your congregation or as a missionary, a country or reaching a region. And that's how it happens in discipleship. And leaders, you need to instill that into your followers. And as we have already said, creating more leaders. Now, true apostolic leaders must affirm to this generation that the church is built upon a rock. You know that. See, we are, you know, somebody told me this the other day. They said, you know, the United Pentecostal Church has kind of been you know, castigated as, you know, how, how ridiculous to make women wear dresses and, uh, you know, and uh, uh, gender distinction, you know, and uh, don't wear that which pertaineth unto a man. And they've hammered that on us for years. And they said, you know what, now it's beginning to make sense. Uh-huh. Because we know what a godly lady looks like, and we know what a godly man looks like, but the world has no idea. Because they just melded it all together. Uh-huh. Until men look like women, and women look like men, and there is no physical distinction. And they're trying to bring disorder to God's order. And they said, you know what? Pentecost says you were right. To say, let the ladies look like a lady and a man like a man. Women cut their hair off until you can't tell whether they're a man or a woman. The Bible is very clear. I'm not going into all of that, but you know it to be true. As the world grows darker and much of Christianity is shaded, the true church only becomes brighter. Instead of being defensive in attitude, let the church be on the offensive posture. Go on the offense. Go out there and win souls. Go out there and see people changed. We have the promises of God. They're given to us. Thy seed shall possess the gate of thine enemy. That's what God told Abraham. Thy seed shall possess the gate of thine enemy. And so when Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. That was a long promise made. That no matter how bad this world gets. God's power is supreme. Yeah, amen. Amen. So, the church reaches into a godless, write that down, atheistic, heathenistic, H-E-D-O-N, heathenistic, compromising world, and stops the onslaught of hell. Have you got anybody in your church that came out of the pits of darkness from horrible lifestyles, from drug addiction and perversions and all kinds of things? I dare say that you do. Preach deliverance and build disciples to survive this end time generation. Listen, if there's ever a time that we needed leaders, it is now. Leaders must stand and Lead in this effort and you stand upon the word of God. 
Now an unshakable kingdom, Hebrews 12, 25 to 29, you read it. But shaking separates the true from the false. And true, true Christianity is revealed when under trial. The Bible says, cast thy burdens on the Lord. Amen. Cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain thee and shall never, everybody say never, never. suffer the righteous to be moved. Never. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. You can go on the offense because he said, I'll take care of the defense. They're not going to be able to destroy you. I shall not be greatly moved. That's Psalm 62 and 2. Now, he will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber, the psalmist said. 121 and 3. Come on, church. Leaders build. They build true Christian principles into believers' lives. It produces unshakable lives. Oh, I remember they used to say, you know, some years ago, you know, build your house upon the rock. Build your house upon the rock. Build your house upon the rock and it shall stand. There's no power on God's earth <laughs> that can come against God's church. Build your house upon the rock and it shall stand. How many believe that? Shout praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Now, we've got the power to do it through the Word of God. Kingdom attitudes, the Beatitudes, preach the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 to 7. Eternal values versus temporal values. Yeah, temporal values say so you can save up money, can live in a nicer home, drive a better car. That doesn't mean anything. Let me tell you something. No matter what you suffer, Pastor, uh, a district official, whatever's going on, for our light affliction, which is but for the moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, that's temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Come on, church! Amen. Isn't heaven going to be a wonderful place when we're all going to be gathered together first time in the history of mankind for God's people to be gathered? They'll be from the Philippines, they'll be from America, they'll be from the British Isles, they'll be from Africa, they'll be from South America. Oh, every tribe and every tongue, I tell you, we're on the winning side, we're on the right side, and if God be for us, who can be against us? So I say, leaders, lead your leaders in prayer, praise, word, purpose, true righteousness, and perseverance. Now I'm going to read you something in closing. Stand together, because it's almost lunchtime. There's a sound of an abundance of food here, but just a minute. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, and I do not know who wrote it, but it says the commitment as a soldier of a cross. How many believe you're a soldier in God's army? Amen. Come on, put up that hand. Hallelujah. And this is what he said. I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. A majority of one. I have the Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of His. I will look back, let up, slow down, be skilled, or be intimidated. My past has been redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, cheap giving, dwarf goals, and worthless endeavors. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on His presence, walk by patience, live by prayer, labor by power, conquer.
Jerusalem in his promises. My faith is set. My gate is fast and steady. My goal is heaven. And my road is narrow. My way rough. My companions food, few. My God reliable. My mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the face of adversity, negotiate at the table of an enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, be angered in the maze of mediocrity, nor sell my birthright for a mess of pottage. I will give up, shut up, let up, until I have stayed up, scored up, prayed up, paid up, preached, witnessed for the cause of Christ, and been taken up. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, heal till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem in recognizing me. My banner will be clear, held high, unfurled, flying strongly in the contrary breeze, moving forward into enemy territory. Come on, lift your hands in place. Is it still burning within your heart? Do you remember that day, that moment, that time, that word, whatever it was, that said, I've put my hand upon you and I've called you for my ministry? I want you to lift up your hands to God right now. Glory, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah, Jesus. God bless every one of these precious neighbors. Oh God, you put a call in their heart. They didn't know there would be storms. They didn't know there would be rough sailing. They didn't know there would be things that would come against them. People would turn upon them in frustration and fears and seemingly failures. But God, you had promised them victory. They yes. are anointed of God, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, I want you to just allow that anointing to be refreshed within your soul right now. Amen. He was saved yesterday, today, and yesterday. He loves you eternally. He knows where you are. He's got your address, and he's going to minister to your need right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, stir our spirits. We need you right now, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Can you turn to your neighbor and honestly say to them, I am called of God. We are called of God. Can you do that right now? If you feel you've got a divine call of God, pastors and ministers. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 